Nietzsche was obsessed with the Greeks. He discovered them as a schoolboy, and one can only imagine the fantasies he must have had as a very young man. They stayed with him throughout his life. In fact, his last crazed note well into the period of insanity, he signed Dionysus. There's a contrast that goes throughout his philosophy between the ancient Greeks and modern bourgeois Christianity. And there's a sense in which understanding what he liked about the Greeks, or what he loved about the Greeks, is essential to understanding what he disliked, and sometimes what he despised, about modern society. He was, of course, a philologist, that means a classics professor. He knew his ancient texts very well. The Greece that he really admired, though, was not the Greece that, as a philosopher, you would expect him to have loved. He thinks that the Greece of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle was already, in some sense, decadent. And the Greece that Nietzsche really praised and admired was the Greece of Homer, the Greece of the ancient Tragedians, the Greece of tragedy. And his first book, The Birth of Tragedy, talks at great length about the ways in which tragedy became possible for the Greeks and consequently the ways in which tragedy has become unthinkable for us now. The obsession with the ancients was not Nietzsche's alone. Germany in general was taken with the Greeks. There was a growing awareness, for one thing, that Germany, and it was not yet fully Germany, but Germany was aware of the fact that it was increasingly a backward country compared with France, compared with England, and consequently it was very defensive. If one traces the history of the 19th century, what one traces is a coming to awareness of German culture, a kind of defensiveness that German culture really does deserve the same place in the sun as, say, French culture or English philosophy. By the time we get to Nietzsche, of course, we've got a unified Germany under Bismarck, but nevertheless, there's still a profound defensiveness about it, and Nietzsche is very keenly aware of this, as opposed, he thinks, to ancient Greece. The influence of the Greeks was so profound, not just on Nietzsche, but on the German cultural elite in general, that Butler, a few years ago, wrote a book called The Tyranny of, Germany, the Tyranny of Greece Over Germany. It's a very apt title. There's a sense in which, since the 18th century, the Germans had looked to Greece as a kind of golden age, the time when human life was, if not perfect, as good as it gets. And modern period, by contrast, is inferior, maybe pathetic. Nietzsche thinks it's very important, though, not to simply to dismiss modernity, because, as I said, when he wrote in a very early essay about history, he made the point that simply getting lost in history, simply bemoaning the fact, as some of his predecessors had done, that Greece was so wonderful and we're so impoverished, that leads to a really lousy life. So the important thing is, Greece should be a kind of model. And he despised his fellow scholars. I'll leave it open to what extent this might still apply today. He called them scholarly oxen, who worried about Greek grammar, who worried about Greek philology, who worried about when such and such was written or performed, but didn't spend even a minute fantasizing about what it would be like to live as a Greek. And in particular, what it would be like to live as a Greek, a Greek German, today. The Greece that he admired is very much the Greece of Homer, or more accurately, since Homer's writing about other events, or talking about other events, really four centuries earlier. It's the Greece depicted by Homer. And of course, this gives rise to one of those rumors we had talked about, that Nietzsche really liked barbarians. And it's hard to think about Achilles and Agamemnon and Menelaus and the, gra and the gang without thinking of them as barbarians. They were. Nevertheless, there's a sense in which the virtues they displayed, the attitude towards life, was something which was enviable. And it was clearly something missing in the modern world. And if you think about the tragedies that were written by the great Greek playwrights, 
This is all before Socrates. Plays like Oedipus, Antigone, the plays about the Trojan women, Prometheus. What you realize is that it's a model of life that we have trouble understanding. It's so cruel. It's so stark. I mean, the idea of a fate driving Oedipus to do these awful things, a curse which had been cast on his father, now extending to him, which of course would extend in turn to his daughter Antigone. The idea of realizing that one had done something pretty awful, murdering your father, marrying your mother, and consequently putting your own eyes out because you had seen too much, that kind of vision to us is just plain awful. And so one of the themes of the birth of tragedy is how it was different for the Greeks and how when they saw these tragedies performed, something very different was going on. In fact, the theme of the birth of tragedy at its very core is that tragedy is a real, honest recognition of what life is all about. And to be sure, Oedipus, Antigone, these are people that face dilemmas, situations that none of us really would like to face. But the truth of it is, of course, we all are going to face our own dilemmas. We all have to face up to death. We all have to face up to the bad things in life. And the question is, how do we do that? Do we accept it as the way things are, or do we rationalize it away? The idea in The Birth of Tragedy, which we'll talk about in much more detail in the next lecture, is that the Greek view of tragedy was possible because two different strains of thought, or two different strains of feeling, came together in a remarkable way. The one, the Apollonian, the rationalistic, saw tragedy as something that happens to the individual. It's a real, personal loss. On the other hand, and what I'd like to emphasize here, is the Dionysian. And the Dionysian is connected up with what you might call the suprapersonal. It's the idea of ourselves as part of the flow of life. And if you think about orgiastic rituals, if you think about what Hegel called Bacchanalian revels, one of the things that's most pronounced about it is a loss of the sense of self, a sense of going with the flow, a sense that one is part of life and what happens to one as an individual really is of no great importance. And that sense of overriding passion, of identity with the whole as opposed to a kind of rational individualism is what Nietzsche thinks allows the Greeks to come up with this notion of, on the one hand, something awful happening to an individual, and at the same time understanding this as something beautiful. The birth of tragedy makes a distinction, however, between two different sets of Greek authors. Nietzsche sees the early great tragedians, namely Sophocles and, your, and, and, and this Aeschylus, as very much in tune with this merging of the Apollonian and the Dionysian, getting the two in balance. Whereas the third of the great three Greek tragedy writers, Euripides, Nietzsche really condemns. And he condemns him in particular because of his linkage, which is debatable in classical circles, but his linkage with Socrates in particular. With Euripides and with Socrates, that's when Greek thought and Greek culture goes into decline. The difference was that Sophocles, Aeschylus saw tragedy as something that's inexplicable, something that couldn't be rationalized. You watch Oedipus or Antigone, both plays by Sophocles, and the overwhelming sense you come away with, apart from the beautiful poetry, is that life is really a mystery, that the things that happen to people can't be explained. With Euripides, on the other hand, what Nietzsche says anyway, is rationalization enters the picture. And of course, whether or not the link with Socrates can be ultimately sustained, that Euripides and Socrates in common tried to explain tragedy in such a way that human beings could ultimately think their way through it. And that's precisely what Nietzsche wants to say one could not do. He also thinks that the ancient Greeks had as one of their primary virtues 
the fact that they were agonistic, the fact that they believed in struggle, that life itself was a struggle. The tragedies make this very clear, and of course Homer's two great books, the Iliad and the Odyssey, make it amply clear to what extent life is always a struggle of one sort or another. The more peaceful version of this struggle, the Olympics, which come after all from ancient Greece, is an illustration of the way in which this sense of ferocious competition is something that goes all the way back to the Greeks. And despite our pretensions, at least until a few years ago, that the Olympics are rather amateurish, if you like, a kind of genteel sporting event. With the Greeks, it was very clear that it was more than that. This cut right to the quick of human nature. It wasn't just sport. It was life. This sense of agon, this sense of struggle, was, Nietzsche thought, what made the Greeks so beautiful. And that's the word he uses over and over again, that they saw life in terms of a struggle, and the struggle itself became an artistic form. The idea of looking at life as a struggle even extends to such supposedly genteel professions as philosophy. One often talks about Socrates in terms of his love of the truth, his pursuit of wisdom, and certainly that's how he talked about himself. But you don't have to read much of Plato to see right through that. What Socrates really loves is a good argument. What he really likes is to get down and dirty in the streets and show that he's the smartest guy of all. Socrates is as competitive as any philosopher has ever been. And in fact, one might argue that Socrates sort of set the model for what philosophers think of themselves today. The important thing is winning arguments. Socrates is often contrasted with the sophists, a, sco a school of philosophers who were pretty much his contemporaries. I sometimes think of them as the ancient equivalent of law school, because in democratic Greece, their function was to teach people the art of rhetoric, to teach them how to make arguments, to teach them how to win arguments. And Socrates contrasts himself on the grounds that that's all they do. What he's about, on the other hand, is the truth. But as several of my class's friends have argued in great detail, I think the truth is that Socrates wasn't against the sophists so much as he was one of them. In fact, he was the best of them. That agonistic sense, life as struggle, life as tension, extended even to philosophy. What Socrates says in philosophy, quite to the contrary. The idea of Greece as agonistic also explains, in Nietzsche's terms, why Greece declined. Because in the early days of Greece, when there were constant wars between the city-states, invasions from the Persians and so on, there was always this struggle. And Nietzsche says, and this is one of the places where he stretches history, as long as the Greeks had a struggle going on, they knew what life was about and they were great. As soon as they found themselves in a period of relative peace, what happened was that that kind of inner instinct for struggle turned against themselves. And that's when they started to decay. The idea of Greek tragedy as two vital forces then gets resolved, or shall we say, destroyed, by an overemphasis by Euripides, but mainly by Socrates, on the rationalistic, on the Apollonian. In fact, one of the th features of Socrates' philosophy, which has often been commented on, but perhaps not in the properly unsympathetic way, is that what Socrates is all about is in a way a kind of denial of tragedy. He says, for example, that the only thing that a truly good man has to worry about is the status of his own soul. And if he is properly attentive to the status of his soul, to the health of his soul, nothing else can harm him. Now, if you think about poor Oedipus, Oedipus was a good man. Oedipus, in fact, did everything that was expected of him. Within the context of the culture, I think we should say Oedipus did everything that Socrates would say he ought to do. 
even, much to his detriment, self-examination of a very profound sort. But the idea that this somehow inoculated him, made him immune from misfortune? Obviously quite the contrary. The truth is, bad things happen to good people. But Socrates' philosophy ultimately is that there is this thing called the eternal soul, which outlives the body, which in fact lives forever. And Socrates had a fantasy of a more perfect world in which his pure soul could think pure ideas without the interference of all these bodily temptations, instincts, and sufferings. As I said, I think the truth is actually the opposite. If Socrates' soul had lived on forever, just thinking by itself, without anyone to argue with, I think, in fact, it would have been a pretty miserable soul. Because Nietzsche's right. What makes Socrates tick is human engagement, human encounter, this kind of competitive struggle. What gives, when, what gives, what gives way when we abandon the Dionysian, the sense of reckless abandon, in favor of the purely rationalistic, in favor of the Apollonian, is that we stop thinking in terms of life. Because life is, after all, at least in part, Dionysian. When we start thinking with Socrates that life is reason, that life is pure rationality, and understanding life, thinking beyond tragedy is possible, then there's a sense in which we deny life itself. As I suggested, Nietzsche's argument even goes further than this. He says, for example, to understand Socrates' philosophy is to understand that Socrates actually hated life. Appearances to the contrary, as I said, Socrates is very clearly in Plato's dialogues a very jolly, happy soul who loves his encounters with his students and other people. Um, he's what we would call a fulfilled human being. Nevertheless, Nietzsche points out that on his deathbed, Socrates, of course, was executed, forced to drink hemlock for supposedly corrupting the minds of the youth and a kind of blasphemy. But when he died, Nietzsche says of him the following. I admire the courage and wisdom of Socrates and everything he did, said, and did not say. This mocking and enamored monster, Pied Piper of Athens, who made the most overweening youths tremble and sob, was not only the wisest chatterer of all time, he was equally great in his silence. I wish he had remained silent at the last moment of his life. But in that case, he would have resp he, sorry, in that case, he might have belonged to a still higher level of spirits. But whether it was death or the poison or piety or malice, something loosened his tongue at the last minute and he said, O Crito, one of his friends, I owe Asclepius a rooster. Asclepius was the, sac the patron saint of health, of medicine, and offering him a, scent, a rooster would have been considered basically paying your doctor for curing a disease. This ridiculous and terrible last word, Nietzsche writes, means for those who have ears, O Crito, life itself is a disease. Is it possible? that a man like him, like Socrates, who had lived cheerfully and like a soldier in the sight of everyone, should have been a pessimist? Shades of Schopenhauer. He had merely kept a cheerful demean while concealing all of his life, his ultimate judgment, his inmost feeling. Socrates. Socrates suffered life. And then he revenged himself with his veiled, gruesome, pious, blasphemous saying. Did a Socrates need such revenge? Did his over-rich virtue lack an ounce of magnanimity? Alas, my friends, we must overcome even the Greeks. The picture there is very clear, that despite all appearances, Socrates didn't like life. Socrates saw life as something to be overcome. The fantasy which he expresses in some of his... Uh, in, the fantasy which he expresses in those works which depict his last days that his soul might live on, just doing philosophy, is a kind of liberation. And Nietzsche wants to say, that's exactly the wrong picture. The right picture is accepting life for exactly what it is and enjoying it for exactly 
what it is. He brings up a Greek myth, which we're going to come back to uh, several times. It's a, Greek, it's a Greek myth also, I suppose a Persian myth, but perhaps best known as a kind of Indian myth. The myth of eternal recurrence, the idea of life circling around, coming back again, and the importance of that myth for Nietzsche, more than anything else, is the idea that life is to be emphasized for the sake of life, not for the sake of an eternal existence, not for the sake, as in Christianity, of a future heaven. That the weight of each moment is such that one should appreciate life and all the moments in life for their own sake. Now, in terms of philosophy, what Nietzsche does is, in fact, looks behind Socrates. If you look before Socrates came onto the scene and before the sophists, there are, in fact, a whole series of Greek philosophers, and we do them the disservice of simply referring to them as the pre-Socratics, as if the first philosopher is really Socrates, and these other guys that appeared first really, well, they only barely count. They're sort of the warm-up act. But the truth is that, well, we don't know much about them. In many cases, we don't have much of their writings. But then you can argue. We really don't have anything of Socrates' writings either because he didn't write. What we have is what we have from Plato and from Herodotus and from some other Greek historians. But the truth is that an awful lot was going on in Greece before Socrates. And Nietzsche, as a good philologist, was well aware of this. But again, he makes distinctions. The philosopher who is clear in a way his favorite, the one who in many ways models his own picture of reality and picture of the universe, is Heraclitus, the philosopher who said that all is flux, everything changes, the philosopher who took as his element the uh, primary substance of the universe, where others said it was water or air or earth. Heraclitus said, it's fire. And the important thing about fire is it's always changing. If you look at a flame, it's never the same, same shape twice. For Heraclitus, struggle, strife, war was the essence of all things. The truth is that people were based on a nature which itself was always in contradiction, which was always moving and changing itself. It's Heraclitus, of course, who says more or less the famous saying, you can't step into the same river twice. The idea being that life is not something static, much less something potentially eternal. Life is something which is always changing. It is what it is. And understanding that is the real wisdom. The contrast here, one of Heraclitus' um, contemporaries, a Greek philosopher named Parmenides, who in many ways anticipates much of Plato, Parmenides taught that reality is and must be of necessity, eternal, enduring, unchanging. All of change is an illusion. The truth is that what we perceive as reality is not that at all. But of course, because what we see is this changing world, it follows that we just don't have the capacity to know reality at all. It is and must be a mystery for us. It's Parmenides' best-known student named Zeno who demonstrates this in a series of famous paradoxes. Uh, the idea of an arrow never reaching its mark because at each instant it's only covered half the space that it did before and consequently if you add up the moments, and of course they didn't know about infinitesimals then, the moments get smaller and smaller and smaller but the truth is, the arrow never reaches its mark. Now, of course, there's lots to say about that. Tom Stoppard perhaps did it best when he has one of his professors in a play say, and St. Sebastian must have died of fright. <laughs> but it seems to me that the basic idea is something much larger. It's Parmenides' philosophy. And that is, here is the clearest example of change, movement. But here I'm going to prove to you geometrically that movement is an illusion, that movement is impossible. And what follows from this is the idea that reality has to be something else than this changing world that we perceive.
This, of course, is the same philosophy that is picked up by Socrates and then most famously by Plato. The differences and similarities between Socrates and Plato is something much debated, and this is not a lecture on Greek philosophy as such, so I'm not going to try and figure out the difference. The truth is, of course, that Socrates didn't write anything. It is mainly recorded by Plato. Certainly some of the ideas were Socrates' philosophical ideas, but equally certainly, much of it was embellished, and later on in his career, I think actually just made up by Plato. So in a way, think of Socrates and Plato in a hyphenated way, at least as far as the philosophy is concerned. And what that philosophy looks like is an emphasis on the eternal, an emphasis on the otherworldly, an emphasis on what Plato called the world of being, a world in which there is no change, a world in which there are only perfect ideals, a world of which this world is only a shadow. And of course, one of Plato's most famous images, which Socrates tells in The Republic, is the myth of the cave, in which we have a story about a bunch of prisoners chained to a cave, and all that they ever see are the shadows on the wall. But suppose one of them were to turn around, break free, and actually see the world itself. It would be so dazzling that he would probably be blinded. And if he came back and tried to tell his fellow prisoners what he had seen, they would be so outraged that they would kill him. Of course, that's not a bad summary of what actually happened to Socrates. But what it also depicts, and what Nietzsche is picking on, is the idea that this world of our experience is not the real one. There is another world which is very different and although Plato didn't say that this world is unreal, nevertheless, it's pretty clear that the world of our experience, the world we live in, is in some very important sense less real, less important than the world of being. And that, to Nietzsche, is the kind of escapism. It's the ultimate refuge of rationality. And that is why Socrates, he says, made reason into a tyrant. Now, this is something to explain in a number of different ways. Part of it, of course, might be put in straightforwardly philosophical terms, in terms of the general trend of Greek thought from the very first philosophers. And we're now talking back to, say, Hesiod the poet and Thales, who is usually credited as being the first philosopher scientist. But through Parmenides, Heraclitus is often ignored here, through Socrates and Plato to Aristotle, and you look at that trend, and one way of describing it is, it is the sophistication, the development of reason. But there's another way of describing it, which is the way Nietzsche describes it. And that is, it is the decline and the neglect of the Dionysian. When I said that Nietzsche says Socrates is ugly, that he was lower class, and ultimately that Nietzsche hated life, that he thought it was a disease, the main point there was to say, what we find in Socrates is a need to escape, an unwillingness to accept life for what it is, the need to somehow see beyond it. And what we get with Socrates, in particular, is this emphasis on reason, not just as a kind of human faculty, a human ability to think, a way of calculating a way of manipulating concepts and so on. All that's fair enough. But reason can do something else. Reason can do what Parmenides thought it couldn't do. Reason can actually see through to the world of being, the world as it really is. And that vision, if not blinding, is so striking, Plato assures us, that once one sees it, one will fall hopelessly and eternally in love and never be able to go back into the cave of ordinary experience. But of course, the other danger, the one that Nietzsche focuses on, is that what you're falling in love with also has to be reflected in terms of what you're falling out of love with. When you fall in love with reason and fall in love with this more perfect eternal world, what you do is you fall out of love 
with this world and with your life. And that's what goes wrong after Greece.